dressing the English woman of the 1780s. On the left, we have a lower or working class woman. In the middle, we have a middle class woman or middling sort. And on the right, we have an upper class lady. All started in a linen shift, stockings and garters to hold them up. The difference being that the upper class garments are of a better and finer quality than the lower class. And next for all classes comes an under petticoat. I'm using a flannel one for warmth, but they could also be linen or a fancier quilted one for winter. These were typically linen or wool, or they could be silk if they were quilted. Now as for the hair, the upper classes had the fanciest updos, while the lower classes tended to go for a regular bun. In the 1780s, however, there was a brief fashion for almost undone or only half updo hair. That was very common amongst middling sorts. And next comes your stays. Within the English fashion, everyone wore stays regardless of class. Unlike in continental Europe, where they were often replaced by softer, less structured corsets, sometimes referred to as jumps or waistcoats, depending on the area you're from. Now, when I say within the English fashion, I don't mean only England. I mean also all the other countries and regions that were affected by English fashion. That includes the US, Scottish, Irish, and Welsh. Much like in later eras, we would talk about French fashions, but those would also be fashionable in other areas. The same is true of the 18th century of either continental or English styles. Stays of this era are typically half boned. That means that there is some space where there isn't boning in the fabrics, unlike in the previous eras where they were fully boned. They lace up with spiral lacing either in the back or both front and back. That means that the lacing needs to be partly or fully undone to get in and out of the stays. A blunt needle, like a darning needle, is used to lace up the laces through the eyelets. And again, the difference between the classes is the quality of the item. The patterning and tailoring and uh, the actual making of the garment might be much better in the upper classes than in the lower classes. Also, lower classes might use second-hand stays that were only altered to fit their body. Also, the upper-class stays would be in the newest and most fashionable shape, whereas the, the lower sorts might have them in a less fashionable shape or lower quality of shape so that the tailor who made them didn't know enough about stay making to really get the shapes the way they are supposed to be. Along with stays, also padding was used to achieve the fashionable silhouette. And here, for a middling sort of person, I'm using a fairly small bum pad. A wooden busk in your stays is used by all classes. This helps keep the front of the stays smooth and straight below the belly. It helps keep the stays comfortable throughout the day by evening out the pressure against your body. And next comes your pockets. These are a separate garment that usually came in pairs like mine, or they could come in separates. Mine are a very plain and utilitarian pair, but they could be as fancy as you wanted them with all kinds of embroidery and other fancy things. Being a separate garment, you can add a lot more weight to them because they won't pull on your outer skirts no matter how much they weigh. And the stays keep you from feeling the weight of them. This is where the nursery rhyme Lucy Lockett lost her pocket comes from. And next comes your petticoat. Unlike in the 19th century, in the 18th century, your petticoat is a visible item. For the upper class lady, we have a fancy silk satin one. For the middle class lady, we we have a fairly nice worsted wool one, and for the lower class, we have a more heavy, rugged worsted wool one. They are all constructed the same by pleating them onto linen tape waistbands that then are tied in the front and back, leaving openings for your pockets. Now, I want to point out that these are examples to show you the difference in wealth and status of these women, but there is actual overlap in the garments that they wear. For instance, a rich lady's lady's maid would be dressed almost as finely as her mistress. Also within the British Empire, only the titled when considered an upper class, so a rich merchant could be more wealthy than an upper class person. For the upper class lady, I'm using a split rump to give the gown the proper shape, whereas the middle class lady is already pinning shut her gown. The type of gown she is wearing is called an English or a nightgown, and this is a gown that was worn by all social classes. Whereas my working class lady gets the most casual of the upper body garments, called a bedgown. 
This was commonly worn at home or for working, and as a non-fitted garment, it was mass-produced in the 18th century. The reason why the upper-class lady is wearing her split rump on top of her petticoat instead of under is so that she can wear the same petticoat with other things, without it being a weird length in the back. And because she'll be wearing an open gown, she is wearing a separate stomacher. Most garments in the 18th century close with straight pins. Even though this might sound impractical and odd to the modern person, it's actually very practical and easy to do once you learn it. It allows for a lot more adjustability than buttons or hooks and eyes, making the clothing a lot more adaptable to weight fluctuations. And the bone stays underneath, keep you from poking yourself with the pins. Well, at least most of the time. Sometimes you can get it between the boning when you're pinning it on. Pins in the 18th century, though, were a little bit more rugged than our common sewing pins, so those can be a little flimsy and sometimes work their way out. Now for a working class lady, she gets a printed cotton kerchief around her neck. A kerchief was a popular fashion accessory for all classes throughout the 18th century, and it also provided sun protection with the more open necklines. And our upper class lady is getting a silk open gown. In modern times, this is often referred to as a zone front because of the shape in the front. And our working class lady is getting an apron to close her bed gown and kerchief. Leather or wool buckle on shoes were the standard footwear for the 18th century. Whereas my upper class lady gets a newer pump style in silk. In the 1780s, it was common to use silk ribbons as fashionable accessories, like the bow and the sash belt that I'm putting on here. This era is very much a transitional era, and if there's a lot of experimentation in fashion. This gown that this upper-class lady is wearing is a good example of that. The fitted back of it is a new version of the English gown called an Italian gown. But instead of closing all the way in the front, it is an open style. And with the sash belt, it's reminiscent of another fashionable gown from that era called a robe a la Turk, which, like the name implies, is inspired by Turkish fashion. The sash could be tied at the side like I'm doing, or it could be tied in the back in a big bow. Now our middle class lady is ready for her accessories. While all classes could wear a printed cotton kerchief, our middle class lady is wearing a silk one. And instead of printed, this one is resistant dyed. Again, body modesty, the way we know it, wasn't really a thing in the 18th century. So they aren't really wearing the kerchief so much for modesty, but more for sun protection and to have something at their neckline. The upper class lady here isn't wearing one because she has the lace around her neckline. And yes, the necklines are extremely low for the gowns, uh, other than the non-fitted workwear. The leather shoes are the same for the working and the middle class lady. But the working class lady has plain brass buckles, whereas the middle class has paste zones on hers. Aprons in the 18th century were not only a practical item, but also a common fashion accessory. During the daytime, they were worn by all social classes. Though as the 80s wear on and the 90s come around, they become less popular amongst the upper classes. Whereas my working class lady is wearing a utilitarian blue linen work apron, my middle class lady is wearing a very finely woven, almost see-through linen one. This would be more for fashion than actual use. As for headwear, caps were the standard for dressing your hair during the daytime. The 80s sees a change in this as hats and also scarves and turbans become another option. Before this, you also had hats, but they were commonly worn with a cap underneath. My working class lady's cap is of cotton and more in line with the earlier period's caps. It covers most of the hair, making it also a practical item that protects your hair from any dust or grease or other things that could fly into it throughout the day. A plain silk ribbon is added for decoration and it is secured with pins. My middle class lady gets a much fancier cap, also made out of cotton, with a very large ruffle framing the face. It covers only the hair partly, making it a much more of a fashion item than a practical item. This is not something you'd wear to keep your hair clean when cooking all day. It too gets a silk ribbon and is secured with pins. And the upper class lady goes with a silk gauze tied around her hair. This too is an Eastern influenced style, reminiscent of the turban, but without a closed crown. For an even fancier look, these were often decorated with feathers or artificial flowers. Even though these clothes are specifically English fashion, the upper class garments at this point were pretty much universally worn throughout the fashionable Western world. So by looking at the upper class lady, you wouldn't really be able to tell where she's from. The lower in class we get, the more regional styles become. 
and the bedgown is very much in English fashion, whereas continental Europe would wear a short gown instead. For jewelry, my upper-class lady gets a chatelaine for her watch, pearl earrings, and a paystone necklace. Unlike today, paystones were not considered much less than, and both were worn by upper classes. Whereas my working class lady gets a simple black ribbon tied around her throat for jewelry. And here all my 1780s ladies are fully dressed for their day. All have pomaded and powdered hair since that is the way of dressing and keeping your hair clean in the 18th century. In the latter part of the 80s though, powdering is becoming less popular, so that's why none of these have very strongly powdered looks. All have brows darkened with clove, and the middle and upper class ladies are wearing rouge on their cheeks and lips. That's it for this time, and I hope to see you again next time. Bye!